Hey everybody, welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. So here we are, and it is about 2 a.m., and I find myself wondering something. Do plants need to sleep? Well, you know what's interesting? Is it sure looks like they close up and sleep. I mean, even this little shrimp here was counting on the fact that the leaves would curl over and he could hide in there. Uh... And this leaf coming up here towards the top, it closes up at night. So, plants definitely react as though they want to sleep, even when I turn their lights on. Let me show you one more example. Alright, so in this aquarium, I've left the lights on, and it's uh, sometime a little after 2 in the morning. So, hi guys, it's dark out. But, the plants are actually still closing up, even though the light is on and the CO2 is pumping. So what is causing the plants to close up and act like it's nighttime? And how do the plants close up? How does a plant move? Uh, they're not an animal, so what do they do to move? All right, guys, it's a pretty interesting explanation. So as far as plants moving, it's really simple and brilliantly simple. Plants at night, they have these little nodes at the base of their stem and at each little uh, needle or leaf on the stem. And if they're a plant like this cabamba here, uh, this is a cabamba uh, caroliniana and then, or americana, and then this one here is fricata. Uh, and they close up at night by simply just having a few cells with water, little chambers, flood and that water then squeezes the the membrane and it causes tension to rise so it's kind of like uh if you've ever had a garden hose laying on the ground and it's folded in half and then you run water through it and it uncurls and sprays everywhere it's that uncurling motion by the water pressure essentially so at night we don't know why plants do this necessarily. Some people think it's to avoid damage. Some people think uh, it's to conserve heat, perhaps, or if it frosts more energy in the plant, which gets burned off as calories and things like that, that they're, they're staying in the plant and together in a tight bunch, so maybe it prevents frost damage. But then why are we seeing it in tropical plants? It doesn't quite make sense. And honestly, all the research I've done doesn't seem to have a good answer. Uh, another one seems to be that pests and things uh, could get in there, but yet again, they can do that in the day as well. So I don't, I'm not convinced by any of those uh, explanations personally. Now this tank over here, it's had the lights off a while, and uh, the, the plants it has that close up, like this mayaka here, it's closed up already too. And uh, even this boost, this boost of philandra, closes up. This is a giant boost species and it closes up at night. So let me know why you think the plants close up. That's, that's a mystery that I can't solve in this video. However, the mystery that I can solve in this video and that I've been researching lately is how much sleep do plants need? And the answer starts with what plants do at night so as soon as the light time is over so when the sun starts going down something happens in plants and it's very different than what happens all day long so in the daytime what plants do is they take the energy from the sun and they store it up like a little battery or a big battery if it's a tree but here we're at this tank because this plant, this red hornwort, is both in the water and above the water, immersed, growing out of the water. Now, when you see fish, you see birds, you see animals, they can't just take the energy of the sun and convert it into energy to use cellularly or metabolically. Now, cold-blooded animals, they can take the energy and then allow chemical processes that occur in their body naturally to happen more effectively but they can't directly turn that into energy to use to stack building blocks so what are plants doing that's so cool and special in the day 
and the reason we actually exist as humans and have something to breathe uh, it's all part of the same system but basically they're able to take this energy and they're able to use it with the atmosphere so in the form of either gases from the atmosphere like carbon dioxide or um, carbon monoxide they're able to literally rip that carbon away from the oxygen whether it's monoxide or dioxide or whether it's uh, nitrous oxide and they rip the nitrogen off of it there's all these trace elements in our atmosphere as well as wherever their roots are but if you've seen epiphytic plants you know that plants like tillandsia like air plants as we call them exist just with water and the atmosphere so that should give you a hint that plants really only need a few things and then the rest is dressing it's the rest is um, dependent on the species and it may need it it may not maybe it helps color it up maybe it helps it uh, hide or do something unique that that plant species does but the moral of the story is that the plants basically just need water air nit air which contains nitrogen oxygen more carbon uh and other trace elements now there's sure there's a little bit of gold there's a little bit of zinc manganese magnesium phosphates all those things well there's a little bit of all those in the atmosphere in the form of dust or in the form of um debris and stuff now, there's also that in soil, in spades, and that's why most plants actually use roots. But when we look at floating plants in the water, or plants that have rhizomes, such as uh, ferns, or uh, bulbitis, like, like African water fern, they are able to actually not even tap into the soil, they're able to use the water. And so they're using dissolved gases in the water. So that's why people inject CO2 in their aquariums to make things grow faster is because it is a building block. So they're literally stacking carbon. Carbon is an element that happens to have eight places, or sorry, six places, uh, oxygen has eight, six places uh, that it can create a bond with other elements on the periodic table. So it's a very, very versatile uh, element in that there's lots of ways it's it's kind of like a lego block that has a lot of ways to connect with other lego blocks whereas if you look at one with say an atomic element of 17 or something uh there it gets too crowded and also the bonds you know there aren't that many ways for things to fit on there so you want that even number and you want that space that it has around it so it's simple enough to be versatile and it's not so unwieldy because it's not so big like some of the bigger things so carbon and uh scientists have predicted that silicone would be the only other uh building block of life in our universe uh don't ask me exactly why there couldn't be other kinds there who knows there could be we don't know everything but due to that logic and due to the logic pattern that we've seen in nature they assume that either carbon or silicone will be the base of all life so moving on from that tangent so the, the plants take in the sun in the form of radiation just like you can see the water making waves the light makes waves so just like you see them rating it radiating out and my finger is putting energy into the water whatever is creating light is creating warmth which is radiation it's creating photons which are these little packets that come in wave well, okay well this gets really complex so we won't go into it they're both a wave and a particle but in any case so they go into the plant and they impart the energy of it now the plant happens to be green because plants have evolved photosynthesis now like we were saying the fish and birds and other things they can't chemically just take the energy from the sun and turn it into energy and stack the building blocks of life that are in their environment and make bonds within their their structure so they have to eat things they have to 
excrete things by going to the bathroom or sweating or uh, regurgitating things. Whereas plants basically only have the option of opening up their pores and uh, letting out some extra elements or flushing out with water elements down through their, uh, their main stem or trunk or roots. And the other option they have is to take any gas they have and allow it to flow just like little blood vessels through the veins of the plants. And you'll, you'll obviously see veins in plants, just like in, in a, your own body, you know, just like every animal has veins, plants have veins, and then the, the delivery system. So the carbon is ripped apart and new bonds are, font, are, are, are made and it grows the plant. Now, the weird little oddball chemicals and uh, atomic elements that are needed in some plants they're gonna vary. So, you know, if we have a plant like the one up here, where we have a bright pink plant, it may have very different needs chemically to make that color in the first place than the green plants. The green plants, the green plankton, the green uh, algae, as we can see on the glass here, that's all still doing photosynthesis. It's all the same thing. It's including in this, uh, this uh, sawasertang, or what we thought for a long time was a pellia, it tends to be a, a fern, but don't worry. So in any case, I mean, all these things are doing the same chemical process, and the, w the reason some of them are different colors other than evolutionary reasons, like uh, camouflage, or to get noticed so they could get pollinated, or because of human selection even, the reason it is because certain times a year, the sun and light comes in at a different angle. And when the sun's coming in uh, in the summer, green reflects to our eye off of the structure of chlorophyll. And that chlorophyll absorbs all the other colors of light. So we only see the green and a little bit of yellow light. A little bit of blue, so the blue and yellow is a green light to our eye. Uh, wavelengths coming back. Well, when the sun is low in the sky, like sunset, it can be a reddish color or an orangish color. And that's because it has more of the atmosphere to go through and it's scattering the light particles, absorbing the light particles differently. Well, just like at sunset, Different times a year, the, the sun is at different angles in the sky, and plants can use different things like anthocyanins and carotenoids, like which they'd get out of the soil usually, to turn colors so that they can absorb different wa wavelengths of light more efficiently. So plants may turn a different color in the fall so that they can get that light lower on the horizon. They can get the last... Um, the the last bits of uh, the most efficient way to absorb that type of light may be a restructuring of the chlorophyll and other carotenoids and things in the leaf so that it's absorbing more light even though it's dimmer it's getting more of the red spectrum for instance and the way that looks to our eye is that it absorbs all the other colors and only reflects the red. So it's getting all the other colors of the spectrum and our eye only interprets the red. So, what are they doing in the day other than all that stuff that I just said? Well, they're, they're, they're breathing. And so they're breathing in the CO2, they're breathing in the, uh, the oxygen and CO2 and nitrogen and nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, any gas, argon, all the trace elements that are in our atmosphere, they're, they're through respiration, we call it, or transpiration is with water, they are allowing it in and they are cleaning the environment. Now, same with our aquariums. Our fish breathe in oxygen through the, their gills in the water and then they let it out as CO2. Uh, they turn it into CO2 because after they metabolize it in their blood, after their blood absorbs that oxygen, the byproduct is going to be CO2. And so the CO2 that they exhale is exactly what plants want. And same with the CO2 that humans exhale uh, and other living things exhale on this planet. 
uh, methane and uh, other natural gases that come out of the earth are also in that mixture, but we're not going to get into all those little details right now. So, in the day, they're taking carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and they're turning it into oxygen for us, which is lovely. But they're storing up the energy of the day in these packets of what we call this chemical ATP, uh, which is the kind of universal currency of energy in any cellular thing, any cellular life form. And in our bodies, in our muscles, ATP is important and it's a, a basically a simplest form of energy uh, in, in a chemical arrangement. Uh, it's kind of like even simpler than sugars or proteins or anything like that. But they start building sugars and proteins and setting it aside in different regions of the plant such as in the stem or in the outside uh, waxy part of the trunk in the in the uh, in the uh, bark of a tree for instance or in the outer layer uh, of live wood in a tree if you know how the outside of a tree uh, is the living part and the center is the dead wood and it grows outward well the tips of the leaves and in the buds it's storing energy in all these places it's also storing gases and in and other things in all of these places and as soon as the sun goes out it takes that energy that it's stored up in the form of sugars and all those waste gases and it releases them so the little dark secret that you may not know about plants is that they release co2 as well as oxygen so they are dumping all that co2 at night back into the environment and all that oxygen they made in the day that's floated off into the environment that's all good and well but at night, the byproduct of them using energy, just like animals, just like us using energy all day long, is carbon dioxide. And so between that and as well as other forms of acids and uh, other byproducts such as water or salts and sweat that we uh, metabolize and excrete, well, plants have to do the same thing with their waste products and they let them go. And it could be that the reason plants close up, another theory to leave you with, is that when they're closing up, see how closed that horn wart was that we were looking at and how closed the ends are up here versus how open it can be in theory? It could be that maybe they're just doing that so that they can move and allow more a surface area to be shown and be excreting those chemicals out into the water so more surface area is showing that excretes those chemicals or gases so i want to leave you guys with the thought of do plants need to sleep yes 100 percent if they don't get sleep if the sun doesn't go down they don't just keep storing energy blindly they have a circadian rhythm, which is just like our need to get tired. So they store energy in the form of those chemical compounds that we talked about all through the day. Nighttime is when they're able to use them. So if it never becomes nighttime, the plants aren't going to grow. Plants do the vast majority of their growing in the night. And just like I've said in other videos when we talk about how do plants curve and twirl, well they grow on the outside curve faster than on the inside curve. So if you were to measure the surface area with the tape measure, the outside of this may be five inches. The inside may only be three and a half inches. So what happens is these are growing at a slower rate, the cells on the inside, where on the outside it senses light so it grows faster and it's a very simple process but it's what causes vines to grow in a kind of corkscrew fashion they alternate which side does it it's what allows sunflowers to turn towards the sun because light is hitting one side and uh, say my palm is the side that's getting the sun well then if they need to face the way that my palm is facing the sun say the sun changes over here all they need to do to rotate is to have the cells right near my thumb 
grow faster than the cells over on this side of my hand or by my wrist so that it extends up like this. And it's very simple. It's just water and cells growing at a different rate. But that on, off, almost as simple as binary situation allows plants to either open or close like the water being stored in them when we talk about them opening and closing. It's the same thing for reaching the sunlight. It's the same thing for if it's night or day and switching metabolism. But if you never allow plants to sleep, they build up waste products. Just like we need to go to the bathroom, we need to sweat, we need to excrete things. Plants do too. And they get full of gases they need to excrete also. And so they need to let all of that go and they need to do that at nighttime. They just can't do it in the day. And so that's why plants start closing up at night. Even when the lights are on, like right now, they know it's the middle of the night, they're ready for sleep. And there are certain ratios that they've evolved to that they're going to need. So you can't trick your plants into thinking they don't need sleep. Now you can maximize the hours and figure out what plant you are looking at. So say you're looking at Busa philandra and you figure out that in on the the border uh, of say um, the equator, the north and south equator, right on the equator, there is going to be the maximum sunlight and they're going to get you know 12 hours of sun, 12 hours of dark or whatever it may be. Um, that might be the max it gets. So 12 would be its max. But when you have plants like uh, Kabamba or Elodia that grow where I'm at, up in Seattle, away from the border, there's, in the summer we get 18 hours almost of sunlight some days. So it can have 18 hours max. Usually that max photosynthetic period, whatever it is that it's evolved to, is where it flowers. And that's when it would replicate the warmest time of the year. And that's going to be your, instead of vegetative growth, that's your fruiting growth. And so we don't need to get into that in this video, but that's going to be your max time before it needs to sleep again. So I hope that answers some questions on how plants use the light from the sun and also that plants need to sleep and why they need to sleep and what they do when they're sleeping versus in the day when they're awake. So at night, they're letting out CO2 and they're growing, they're using those building blocks, they're moving, they're orienting for the sun or whatever they need for more water in the soil, they're growing one direction or another. And in the day, they're soaking up that radiation and they're breathing out oxygen as the waste product of what they're doing metabolically with photosynthesis. I hope this was interesting to you guys. It's something that I was curious about for a long time, and I figured I'd cover a few topics in one video when we make it a little longer. Let me know if you want me to chop it up also into uh, one specific category, a three-minute video of why do plants need darkness, you know, something like that. I kind of wanted to talk a little longer. Go figure. All right, thanks for joining me, guys, and I'll talk to you next time on The Secret History of Living in Your Aquarium. If you like this, please hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't yet and you want to know more about things in your aquarium. But if you don't, I'll talk to you, well, never. So uh, either way, have a great day. I'll talk to you later. Bye.